So how many millimeter, milliliters of room temperature water must be mixed with 180 mils of hot coffee so that the resulting combination will have a temperature of 60 Celsius, which is a reasonable temperature for drinking coffee or any hot beverage. So if you wanted to cool your coffee down quickly, boiling to a drinkable temperature, you could add room temperature tap water to it, right? If you were going to do that, how many milliliters of water would you have to do to add to bring the temperature from 95 to 60? You could just wait for it to cool down, but then I wouldn't be able to ask you this question. Then I'd have to ask you a harder question about the rate of heat transfer. And we haven't gotten into rates and calculus with chemistry yet. So we'll stick with this one for now. Incidentally, it's not necessarily watered down coffee. It's, it's a feature, not a bug. This is how you make an Americano. Take espresso and you add water to it till you get to the right volume that you want. We added milk instead, then we'd have a slightly different heat capacity. For the milk, we could still make the assumption that it was close to the same heat capacity for the sake of doing this. So if it makes you feel better, we can call it room temperature milk instead of water. All right, so we have two things changing temperature here, right? We have hot water cooling down. We can call it, we'll call it coffee so we can tell the difference. And then we have um, the cool water warming up. And what do we know about the two cues? If they're both ending at the same final temperature, they must be equal to each other, equal but opposite. So that Q for the coffee and Q for the cold water. When we start, when we add cold water to coffee, it doesn't really seem like we still have two different things anymore, right? But for the sake of doing math, we can assume um, that they're going, we can treat them like they're still separate instead of mixed. We can, because we still have all of the cold water molecules still have the same average speed when they're cold water, even if they're mixed in with the hot water, right? So mathematically, it makes no difference if they're mixed together um, or if we added cold water in a Ziploc bag, we wanted to add cold water in a Ziploc bag to keep them separate. Mathematically, it doesn't make a difference. So we can treat them like they're two separate things. It's easier to visualize that when we're talking about, about like a metal, a solid and a liquid. It's easier to visualize them as still being two separate things, but two liquids mixed together are still two separate groups of molecules. So what do we know about, we know that this has to be true. What are we trying to solve for? Yeah, it, the question actually asks how many milliliters of room temperature water, of cold water. But if we can get to mass of cold water, that's good enough, right? So we want mass of cold water. We know specific heat of cold water. And on this side, we've got mass of coffee, specific heat of coffee, which we're assuming is the same as the water. It's pretty close. Delta T for the coffee and delta T for the cold water. If we're assuming that these two are the same, does it actually even matter what, what it is? Once we set these equal to each other, we can divide both sides by the specific heat, right? So if we wanted to take this as two separate pieces, if we wanted to calculate how much energy does it take to cool the coffee down and put it in joules, and then take those joules and plug it in here to get to solve for mass, we would actually have to use the specific heat, right? But in this case, if we set it up like this, this is actually going to make our, our life easier, make it simpler mathematically, because these two are the same, right? 
So we can divide both sides by the specific heat. Since it's the same, it's just going to cancel out. What else do we know? Really everything but the mass of cold water, right? Except to pull it out of the word problem. We have 100 mils of coffee. What's the density of coffee of in this problem? One gram per milliliter, right? So if we have 180 milliliters and every one milliliter is 1.00 grams, that's going to make our lift life pretty easy. Nice one-to-one -one calculation there, right? So our mass of coffee is 180 grams. What's delta T for coffee? We do the subtraction before we plug it in, but we could also just do 60 degrees Celsius minus 95 degrees Celsius, final minus initial, right? Here's what we're solving for. And delta for the cold water is 23 to 60, right? We're trying to end at 60 degrees Celsius minus 23 degrees Celsius. So like a lot of our word problems, it's this is really all about recognizing the variables in the word problem and knowing what, or sorry, recognizing the units in the word problem and knowing what variables they go with, right? This one's got the extra assumption that we do this all the time. Anytime we have two things changing temperature and ending at the same temperature, usually that's because one thing is giving away heat to the other, right? And it's, if we can make the assumption that all of the energy from the from the coffee is going into the cold water, we can do this and set them equal to each other. So this is going to be minus 35. This is going to be, what, 37? Plus 37, but we're going to wind up with a negative sign moving over. We distribute that negative sign. Thirty five and thirty seven are pretty close to the same number, right? So, in terms of doing a reasonableness check knowing about what M should be before we even plug anything into the calculator, what should M be close to? Pretty close to 180, right? It's going to be the cold water is warming up a little bit more than the hot water is cooling down, but not by very much. And it should be should it be a little bit less than 180 or a little bit more than 180? A little bit less than 180. What do we get? Oops. 170. After sig fig, so 1.7 times 10 to the 2 grams. Which is also going to be our milliliters, right? Because we still have that same 1 to 1 ratio. All right, so with that in mind, how did yesterday's lab go? Straightforward. There's a lot of ways we can set up these Q equations, but at the same time, it's the same thing every time, right? All right, so let's talk about how energy gets involved when it's when we have chemical reactions happening. Because Chemical reactions frequently have energy involved, right? You think of a chemical reaction that has a um, change in energy involved, something that causes the, the surrounding temperature to change. 
Don't think too hard. What's a chemical reaction that causes the energy or the uh, temperature to change? Burning is something, right? Burning something is a reaction that has some temperature change associated, right? That means that there's a release of energy, just like when we were talking about the phase changes, we had delta H effusion. So H2O solid goes to H2O liquid. We had a delta H, a change in enthalpy for that. Um, for this reaction, going to a solid or liquid, we had to put energy into it. And we had it in 334 joules per gram. We could apply the same logic. We've done some math with this, right? Where we've done some calculations. How much energy does it take to melt the ice, right? If it was, wasn't as simple as a phase change, if it was a different chemical reaction that has a delta H associated with it, does anything really change? The balancing can get a little bit tricky. We can't really do it in, in joules per gram if we have two different reactants reacting together. But at the same time, we can still treat it the same way. We can still, we're still going to wind up with a delta H value in kilojoules per mole usually. And if we have kilojoules per mole, we can use that to figure out how much energy is being absorbed or released by any reaction, not just phase changes. So here's an example of a chemical reaction that has its own change in energy. And really that delta E should be delta H, just like we had before. Um, I missed that when I prepped these slides. Um, but just because we have, we have CH4, I'll put the phases in as a gas, plus 2O2 as a gas, reacts to give CO2 and water. And make sure it's balanced. Does anybody know what this reaction is? This is a compound called methane, which is the main component in natural gas. So this is basically just burning natural gas, like on a gas stove. And it has some energy associated with it. The energy for this reaction is negative 802.3 kilojoules per mole. So with this number in mind, we talked about the terms exothermic or endothermic, maybe in your other chemistry class. What does exothermic mean? Releases heat to the surroundings, right? Makes the surroundings warmer. We're burning natural gas. You know what that reaction looks like, right? So we should be making the surroundings warmer. So does that make it an exothermic reaction? Yeah, it's the definition of an exothermic reaction. Why is this negative then? Exactly. So the chemicals are losing energy. The chemical bonds, remember we, we talked about how delta H is really a measure of the change in the, the um, chemical bond energy. If the bonds, the chemicals are losing 800 kilojoules per mole, where is it going? To the surroundings, to the rest of the, the I can't use the term rest of the system, um, but to everything else, the rest of the universe, technically. Um, so anytime you've got a delta H that's negative, that means that the chemicals are losing energy, surroundings are gaining energy. So really, we could also write it as a product here. We could say plus 802.3 kilojoules. And if delta H is positive, that means you're putting energy into the chemical bonds. And that's your endothermic reaction. When you have to put energy into the chemical bonds, that energy has to come from somewhere. It comes from the surroundings. So the surroundings will get colder 
so that you can take that energy and put it into the chemicals. The other thing I want to talk about is this is in units of kilojoules per mole, but it doesn't specify kilojoules per mole of what? Is that kilojoules per mole of oxygen? Or kilojoules per mole of methane? Or kilojoules per mole of both? Finish that thought, Josie. So if I wrote this differently, you can get, just like you can have delta H of fusion means for a phase change, you can have delta H of combustion. We're usually just abbreviated COM. Um, that would be kilojoules per mole of whatever you're talking about. Different organic compounds are going to have different delta H of combustion values. Um, but when it's written this way, when it's delta H of the reaction, it's kilojoules per mole of the reaction. So if this was a more complicated balancing, um, so what's a what's a good example? Let's well let's do ethane. I think ethane will work. Um, I don't have the energy off the top of my head for ethane. Well, let's just go back and do practice balancing things. So the other major component of uh, natural gas is ethane. And when you burn it in oxygen, you still get CO2 and water. How does this one balance out? When, well, we know we've got to have at least two CO2s, right? And that's going to give us three waters. So how many oxygens do we need? We have a total of seven oxygens on the right-hand side, right? Can we get to seven oxygens using only O2s? So what do we have to do? Double everything. So now if we had delta H, it's going to be probably something like 1,200 kilojoules per mole. Well, everything has a coefficient in front of it. So is this kill so now and they're all of the coefficients are different. So now kilojoules per mole per mole of what makes kind of a big difference, right? And so this is where we wind up saying, well, it's really kilojoules per mole of react of the reaction itself. Um, so to give you an idea how we can use this, we'll go back to methane because I have the value that I trust more written down right there. If we burned a certain amount of methane and we had delta H in kilojoules per mole, how much energy is going to be released? But, well, I just had this written where we had plus 802 as a product, right? Anything that's a, that's in a balanced chemical reaction, can you can do stoichiometry with, right? So basically when you have a balanced chemical reaction like this, You know, two kilojoules. We can say, okay, well, I've got 1.5 moles of methane for every, and then we're going to do a stoichiometry step that's just like if we we're doing chemical to a chemical, where we're just going to take the coefficient and say one one mole of of CH4 is equal to 102 or say 802 kilojoules released. 
right? So just like we did with uh, with the Delta H effusion, except those were given to us in grams, kilojoules or joules per gram, because the way that this class used to be taught is you would learn about energy before we actually learned what a mole was, um, which kind of seems backwards, which is why we're not doing it that way anymore. Kilojoules per much more common because it allows us to do more complicated reactions where we have more stoichiometry happening. So we should get something like 1200, right? 1.203 times 10 to kilojoules. Yeah. So when it's written as a delta eight, so the question was, um, why did I write 802 as a positive number when I did it, when I added it as a product here? When it was negative, when I had it written like this. Well, the, the positive and the negative and a delta H is basically telling us whether it's a product or a reactant. And so I didn't put a, um, I, I can't really say minus 802 kilojoules because we don't say, say it that way, we'd say 802 kilojoules was lost or absorbed for the reaction. So because I know it's exothermic, because it's a negative, I'd make it a product. But the other way you can think of that is like it, I'm putting released here. And that released is part of that, basically taking into account the sign here. Right? If it was a positive, that'd be an endothermic reaction. I wouldn't write plus 802 on this side. I'm using up 802 kilojoules. So I'd write it over here, but still is a positive number. It's just saying you need to add 802 kilojoules to the, to the reaction for it to happen as sort of like the cost of doing business. So when we're dealing with these Delta H values, Easiest thing to do is to treat that positive and negative as just a way to tell you if it's a reactant or a product, if it's exothermic or endothermic. And other than that, you don't need to worry about the negative sign that much. All right, so let's do another practice. So charcoal is primarily carbon. When you burn carbon, it's literally, the reaction is literally just carbon plus O2 as a gas forms CO2. So start by trying to write out that reaction. And then you're given a, oh, it's written right there. Never mind. Written for you. Carbon is a solid plus O2 goes to CO2. And we have a delta H for that reaction. Does the, does this reaction being exothermic, does that make sense logically? Yeah, what do we burn coal for? Like nothing ideally anymore, but for heat, right? Um, or to generate electricity in coal burning power plants. So it should be giving off energy. The balancing in this one is really simple. You don't even have any water being produced. The question says, determine the mass of CO2 produced by burning enough carbon in the form of charcoal to produce five times 10 to the two kilojoules of heat. How can we answer that question? This is a stoichiometry problem, right? This is basically an, a, um, a theoretical yield question, except you're given this amount, 
we shift this over so I can write it like we usually do our, our stoichiometry problems. We want to know how many grams of CO2 are going to be produced if we also produce 5.00 times 10 to the 2 kilojoules. If we have delta H equals negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. How are we going to solve this? Does it matter how much carbon we have? Not for this problem. Assuming we have enough carbon that we can burn it, we're going to ignore everything on this side, basically. All we're at, interested in is, I made 500 kilojoules. How many grams of CO2 is that? Well, just set it up like it's a stoichiometry problem. Here's how much energy I made. 10 to the 2. I'm just going to start writing that as... What's the stoichiometry step look like? What's the conversion going to look like? Three ninety three on top or bottom? Three ninety three point five kilojoules. And what goes on top? Moles of what? Could be moles of car. Everything has a coefficient to one, right? So we could actually put whatever we want on top. Could be moles of one mole of carbon, one mole of O2, one mole of CO2, because all of them have a coefficient of one. If you have a coefficient that's not one, like it, let's say we had a reaction that did that, we would just say two moles of CO2. And so in this case, because the problem is specifically asking us about grams of CO2, we're say one mole of CO2 made. What's the last step? Moles to grams. One mole CO2, 44.015 grams. 014 grams. No. Oh. There we go. So there's really nothing different about having an energy as long as we have the energy for a balanced reaction. As long as it's a, just like with any stoichiometry, as long as the reaction's balanced, we can do steps like this because we can say one mole of CO2 produced means five or 393.5 kilojoules of energy released. It's starting to make sense why we spent so much time on conversions early on. Turns out almost everything in Gen Chem you can represent as a conversion if you try hard enough. The old, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So we should get something like, it's going to be, what, 1.25 moles times 44, so about 55 to 60. Fifty-five All right. Don't think that's the only example. We're going to do. We'll do more examples with uh, energy and reactions. And your quiz. One of your quiz questions this weekend will be a problem kind of like this. Um. And we can also tie these two types of questions together because we can say something like, okay, if the reaction, if you start by burning one mole of carbon, a glass of water heated by, the, by that reaction warms up by this many degrees. How many kilojoules of energy went into the water? How many kilojoules per mole is that? So we can actually find delta H 
in kilojoules per mole pretty easily by just doing calorimetry like you did yesterday with the with the um, styrofoam cups, right? It's really, really high tech calorimeters. All a calorimeter is, is an insulated container for holding water where you can watch a temperature change. So technically a styrofoam cup, as long as you're measuring the temperature before and after, that's actually what makes it a calorimeter, not really anything else. Just the ability to measure the temperature before and after. Or I guess desire. If you don't have to want, if you have to, if you don't want to measure the temperature before and after, it's not really a calorimeter now, it's just a coffee cup. All right. Let's talk about types of chemical reactions. Um, so depending on what textbook you use, there's lots of ways to classify chemical reactions. The problem is no two textbooks agree on the best way to count to classify chemical reactions. And for good reason, that's not just chemists can't agree on anything. Um, that's also true. Um, but depending on what you're studying, you're going to have a different way of classifying these reactions. So typically, at a, at a level, you get something that looks like this, where it's all just like, okay, well, if you start with two pieces and you make one piece, one molecule, we'll call that synthesis because you're making something bigger than you started. Um, don't get too worried about writing this down because I'm going to throw this out the window in a second. Um, but all of these basically are just like, okay, well, if you just know what what you start with and what you end with, then you can say based on did things get bigger or did things get smaller or did things more or less stay the same size and use that to classify the reaction. I don't particularly like that because it kind of ignores the actual process that's happening. Um, if you look at a different Gen Chem textbook, you get it classified as precipitation reactions, acid base reactions, gas evolution reactions, and redox reactions, of which combustion is a subset. Okay, well, why am I telling you this? Here's an even simpler version you can have addition, decomposition, or neutralization. That's too. Oh, that's oversimplifying things. If you go take a um, OCHEM class, you can wind up with a classification that looks at is the reaction nucleophilic or electrophilic or a free radical reaction? Is it a substitution or an addition or an elimination? We don't care about any of that because we're not studying OCHEM yet, right? Study biochem. You've got enzyme classes. Enzymes catalyze reactions. And so you can count, you can classify your reactions based on the type of enzyme you catalyze. Like the oxidoreductase or a transferase or a hydrolase or lyases or isomerases or ligases. Don't mix up your ligases with your lysases. Um, this is, doesn't make any sense to us either, right? But the, the point I'm trying to make here is that depending on what aspect of chemistry you're focused on, you're going to classify your reactions differently. And since most of you really settled into necessarily what area of chemistry you're going to be focused on, if you, if any. Um, I figured we narrow this down to the simplest type of react way of classifying reactions. Basically treat it like it's a flow chart. The basic way of separating these into different categories is either electrons change hands or they don't. If electrons don't change hands, that's going to be one of our classes of reactions. That has going to have a few subclasses that, that we're going to study for this for this class. Um, and if electrons do transfer between nuclei, that's our second group, right? And so this this is the classification method we're going to use. So for the most part, all we really need to do, at its most basic, is to look at and say. Does anything change charge? Do any atoms have a different charge at the end than they did when you started? If yes, then it's the first type. If everything's the same charge afterwards, then it's the second type. This seems a little bit more easy to wrap your head around, right? And this applies to every other type of chemistry. Even the biochemists with all their fancy enzymes and you know, biochemical pathways and stuff like that still classify the reactions as it's a redox reaction or it's not. 
right? And so those, if you're changing, if electrons are changing hands, that's an oxidation reduction reaction. It's really two processes happening. Um, something is losing electrons. We call that oxidation. Something else has to gain those electrons at normal um, temperatures on Earth. Um, then you have, to, then all electrons have to basically have a home. They're going to be around a nucleus somewhere. So with that in mind, if you lose electrons from one part of this reaction, they have to be somewhere else. So you're always going to have these two pieces happening at the same time. And then the sub, the second type. I kind of, I'm trying to come up with a good way of naming this. I call this a complexation reaction where you're changing basically how things are configured, but everything is the same charge as it was. Every atom is the same charge as it was before. Um, I'm not tied to this name. It's just the best name I've found so far. So if you think of a better way, I guess I could say non-oxidation reduction, but that kind of seems... I'm not sure that that would help because then you're going to wind up confusing things with the names being so similar. Um, the a short way of saying oxidation reduction, call it a redox reaction. And complexation, not redox. Basically, everything else goes into the same category, which will then, again, like I said, we're going to treat this like a flow chart. There's more than one type of complexation reaction. But broad strokes, all we need to say is it's not a redox reaction. And so within those two, the two, the four types of reactions we're going to look at in this class. There are, like I've mentioned, um, there are lots of reactions that happen as well as these two, but these are the most common reactions that happen anywhere in any field, really. Um, the most common complexation reactions are going to be are what we call precipitation reactions or acid base reactions. And then the most common redox reactions are metal-metal redox reactions, basically where you wind up with metal ions changing charge. Those are really easy to recognize um, because when we're dealing with metals, everything is either an ion floating around by itself or it's, it's um, present as an ionic compound. And we're all pretty good at this point at figuring out the charges on ionic compounds, right? If we know what, that it's an ionic compound, we can work backwards to figure out what the charge is on a metal. And if I said lead, lead four oxide as a solid reacts to form PbCl2 as a solid. Did the charge on the lead change? What was, what's the charge on the lead up here? Plus four. And down here, plus two. Boom, the charge on the lead, on one of your atoms changed. Boom, by definition, it's a redox reaction. As soon as you can point to something that changed charge, an individual atom that changed charge, it's a redox reaction. And if you looked at all of the at all of the um, charges before and after, and everything is the same, it's not a redox reaction. So, for instance, um, HCl plus NaOH going to NaCl and H2O. What's the charge on the sodium here? Plus one. What's the charge on the sodium here? Plus one, it didn't change. It was neither re uh, reduced nor oxidized. What about here for the chloride? What's the charge? 
uh, if we treat this like it's an ionic compound, it's an acid, right? But if we treat it like it's an ionic compound, chloride's a minus one and the hydrogen's a plus one, right? So, and then what's the charge on the chloride here? Still minus one. What do we do about water in this case? How do we know if the charge changed on a covalent compound? Well, basically, we have something that's it's a little bit like formal charge. Remember how we used formal charge to decide what Lewis dot structures were better? And that was basically, it was based on how many bonds something had versus how many lone pairs it had, right? Oxidation state. is basically treat everything like it's an ionic compound and make your most electronegative elements happy first and see what the charges are on everything if you treated it like it was an ionic compound. So if we're looking at water here, what is, what's most electronegative, hydrogen or oxygen? Oxygen, right? How do we figure out what's more electronegative if we're looking at a periodic table? Closest to fluorine, right? Fluorine is the most electronegative, so closest to the top right. So if oxygen is in an ionic compound, what's its charge? When oxygen, how many electrons does oxygen need to get to be stable? It needs to gain two, so it has a charge of minus two. So even though this isn't an ionic compound, we're going to treat it like it's an ionic compound. Say the oxygen is a minus two. If the oxygen is a minus two and the whole thing is neutral, what's the charge on the, each hydrogen? The charge, the hydrogens have to add up to the plus two, and there's two of them. So that process, just treat everything like it's an ionic compound is going to be the way that we can tell whether or not something's a redox reaction. Even if it's a covalent compound, you just go through and say, okay, well, that's an acid. We've kind of classified that as its own thing, right? But chloride is more electronegative. So we say, okay, chloride, how many electrons are you going to grab? And then hydrogen has however many electrons that are left to make sure that the charge adds up to zero. So in this case, I, we already kind of did that. We said plus one, and hydrogen's here, plus one. So did the hydrogen change oxidation state? No. Did the oxygen change oxidation state? We didn't do it. We didn't look at oxidation states for the sodium hydroxide yet, did we? Well, this. We have three elements here, so we can't just do most electronegative and then whatever's left over, but we're still going to start with at the extremes. What's most electronegative? It's the oxygen. So what's the charge on the oxygen? Still got to be minus two. If there's enough electrons around, oxygen will always be minus two. The only time oxygen's not minus two is if fluorine gets involved or other oxygens are attached to it. And out of this, we can't really say the hydrogen sort of in the middle in terms of electronegativity, but we do know that sodium is usually present as an ion, right? Sodium's charge is usually a plus one, like we already we were already talking about over there. So what's the oxidation state on the hydrogen? If the whole thing has to add up to zero, because this whole compound has a charge of zero, what's the charge on the hydrogen? Plus one. So coming back over here, hydrogen was a plus one when it was part of HCl. Hydrogen's a plus one when it's part of NaOH. Hydrogen's plus one when it's part of water. So hydrogen did not change oxidation state. Oxygen, oxygen did not change oxidation state. 
Chloride did not change oxidation state. Sodium didn't change oxidation state. We've looked at everything in here. Nothing changed oxidation states, right? Something definitely happened. We had a chemical reaction happen, but it's not a redox reaction. And this is why we have that sort of that bifurcation where we're splitting it up into two groups. If you can look and see a charge changing, it's a redox reaction. And the way you, you show that and determine that is by looking at oxidation states. Did I see a hand up? All right, let's do one that's pure covalent compounds. In fact, we'll use the reaction we just used a minute ago. Is this a redox reaction? How do you know that? Well, we're going to go through the logic, but partly because I already told you it's a combustion reaction, and in the slide has combustion listed as a redox reaction. But it doesn't look like electrons are changing hands because everything is neutral on both sides, right? There's no ionic compounds before and after. So we are going to use uh, oxidation states to show it. And Scott, what was your first instinct with that? Was to look at the oxygen gas. What's the oxidation state on oxygen gas? It has, to, so here's the other thing about oxidation states. They always have to add up to the total charge of the molecule which usually is neutral, but not always, if you had a polyatomic ion um, or something like that. So we have two oxygens and their charges have to add up to zero. And they also have to be the same because the two oxygen atoms are equal. So what's the charge have to be on each oxygen atom? What's the only two numbers you get that are equal and add up to zero? Zero and zero, right? So oxygen starts off as a zero. Y'all didn't grow up with the Hercules Disney movie, did you? For some reason, zero to hero just popped up in my head when I said that. Uh, it starts off as a zero. What is it going to be over here? When As soon as we put oxygen with something that's not oxygen or fluorine, it's the most electronegative thing around, right? So what's the charge on each oxygen? Two minus, and there's two of them. So what's the charge on the carbon here? It's gotta be a plus four. They have to add up to zero because CO2 is neutral. We already did water once, but once again, oxygen's gotta be negative two. If there's enough electrons around, oxygen will be negative two, which makes the hydrogens each plus one. So the oxygen goes from a zero to two minus. What's the oxidation state on the carbon and the hydrogen and methane here? What's more electronegative, carbon or hydrogen? Carbon. So how many electrons does carbon need to grab to have a full valence? So what's the oxidation state on carbon if it get, grabs four extra electrons? Minus four, which makes the hydrogens, there's four of them and they're all plus one. So if the oxygen went from a zero to a minus two, did it gain or lose electrons? Start at zero, goes to a negative two, it gained electrons. That process of gaining electrons rather counterintuitively is called a reduction. It's dumb really that it gained something, but it's a reduction reaction. 
But what is reduced? The charge got reduced, right? So the charge dropped, which means it's a reduction reaction. So what's the opposite of, an ox of a reduction reaction? Oxidation. So what's the oxidation? What's oxidized here? It's not the hydrogens because they don't change. It's not the oxygen because it's being reduced. So it's got to be the carbon. The carbon going from a minus four to a plus four is an oxidation reaction. Right. Did you learn about how to uh, whether something was a redox reaction or oxidation versus reduction before? There's really, there's a couple of ways you can memorize that. My favorite is Leo the lion. Leo says Gur. Helps if you spell it right. It's the trick with those mnemonic devices, right? Leo says Gur. Leo stands for losing electrons is oxidation. GER stands for gaining electrons as reduction. So just a way to keep it keep it straight. The, really, the easiest way to look at it is to say, oh, the charge is reduced. That makes it a reduction reaction. If your charge gets more negative, then that's a reduction. If your charge goes up, that's the opposite of a reduction, which is oxidation. Um, the other one... Is oil rig. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. That one always sounded a little bit more like something out of 1984. Like knowledge is ignorance, war is peace, ox reduction is gain. Um, but either of those work to remember it. Leo the Lion says, Gurr. And that, that allows you to look at a reaction, not just tell if it is a redox reaction, but what's being oxidized and what's being reduced. Backwards. So, and like I said, the simplest redox reactions are the ones where you've got ionic compounds, because usually, if you've got something like sodium metal turning into sodium ion, that's really easy to recognize because you don't even need to really stop. As soon as you can look at something, say that atom changed charge, boom, you know, it's a redox reaction. And that's easiest with ionic compounds. Um, and if you can recognize a combustion reaction, we just proved that combustion reactions are redox reactions. So as soon as you can recognize a combustion reaction, you know it's always going to be a redox reaction. Um, and the combustion reactions are probably the sing single easiest type of reaction to recognize because they always have um, the same two products, and they always have one. They always share one. Um, reactant. It's always going to be something with carbons and hydrogens plus oxygen and it always makes CO2 and water. The balancing changes depending on what, what hydrocarbon we have over here. And occasionally we might even have something with an oxygen over here as part of this. Um, for instance, if we had ethanol burning it would be C2H6O plus O2 goes to CO2 plus water. But as soon as you see plus O2 and CO2 and water, it's combustion every time. And every combustion reaction is a redox reaction. What if I think about a reaction that's that's not a metal metal redox and it's not a combustion reaction but it's still a redox reaction well it turns out there's lots of those so for instance 
Um, nitrate reacting to form nitrite. Let's practice our oxidation states here. What's our oxidation state on oxygen? Minus two every time, unless there's no other elements around. And there's how many of them? So what's the charge have to be on the nitrogen? It's gotta be positive, five plus five. We need them to add up to minus one. So the nitrogen is going to cancel out all but one of the oxygen's charges. So nitrogen, nitrate, the nitrogen is a plus five oxidation state. What about nitrite? Well, it's still oxygen. So it's still minus two because it's the big bully and gets first dibs. There's just only two of the, of the oxygens around now. It's still got to add up to minus one. So what's the charge on the nitrogen here? So this is definitely a redox reaction. More specifically, is, is the nitrogen being oxidized or reduced? It gains electrons because you go from a plus five to a plus three, which makes it a reduction. But this isn't a metal metal redox and it's not a combustion reaction. So if I asked you on a quiz or a test, what reaction type is this? We could definitely say it's a redox, but it doesn't fit into a, either of our most common redox categories. So we would just leave it as redox. I don't know how to classify this, but I know it's redox. That's, a, that's an answer for this one. So on your quiz this weekend, I'm going to have you classify some of these reactions. And it's going to be a check all that apply are going to be the options. And so it's going to be, there's going to be six boxes you can check. Complexation, redox. And then there's going to be precipitation, acid base, metal, metal, redox, combustion. If you know it's a redox, but it's not a combustion and it's not a metal metal redox, you just click redox and you leave the rest blank. If it's a combustion, you click com redox and a combustion, right? Because it fits both of those. Combustion is the better type, but it also fits under the umbrella of a redox reaction. Combustion is just more specific. With that in mind, we'd probably better look at these two complexation reactions too before we run out of time, right? We've got another 15 minutes. That's perfect because there's nothing as complicated as the redox of uh, or oxidation states we need to worry about. If you look at a reaction and it's not a redox reaction, you can tell that because you looked at your oxidation states before and after. Everything's the same. The two most common types of complexation reactions are a precipitation reaction and an acid base reaction. And a precipitation reaction, let's see which order I have them on. There we go. So an acid base reaction is basically going to be anytime you can look at something and at the products and the reactants, and you can see that everything's still the same. You just move a single H plus from one molecule to another molecule. That's an acid base reaction. So for instance, if we started with this compound, which we would name as, you guys didn't forget all your polyatomics over the break, did you? They're ingrained in there, right? That's nitrate, which makes this nitric acid. If you have nitric acid and this compound called ammonia, and if I had filled it, this in and, I, and our products are, is ammonium nitrate. And really, I probably would separate these out as ammonium ion 
remember from our from our polyatomic ions and nitrate. Does any is anything really changing in terms of electrons? And it kind of looks like it because we have two neutral compounds here and these are both charged. But that's a nitrate there and it's still a nitrate, right? We just did the oxidation state for nitrate. That's a plus five. And those are all minus two, right? We did the same thing here. It's still going to be a plus five on the nitrogen and three minus twos. We just have an H plus on there too. What's the oxidation state on ammonia? What's the hydrogen going to be? It start with the most electronegative one. What's the oxidation state on the nitrogen here? The nitrogen is most electronegative. It gets to be three minus three, right? Because it needs to gain three electrons to be stable, which makes the hydrogens all plus one. What about over here? Nitrogen still the most the most electronegative element, right? So did its oxidation state change? Still minus three. We just have four hydrogens now, and they have to add up to plus one. So what's the charge on each hydrogen? Still plus one. There's just four of them now. So all of that to show. We looked at every single atom on both sides, and all of them have the same oxidation state. So it's definitely not a redox reaction. And as soon as you can look at it and say, oh, well, the nitrate just lost an H plus to become nitric acid turned into nitrate. The ammonium just went, gained an H plus to go from NH3 to NH4 plus. As soon as you can recognize that, that is your dead giveaway. It's an acid base reaction moving an H plus from one atom to, or from one molecule to another molecule. All right, and so sometimes these are, these are, I call them clues because they're not always gonna be the case. Well, the last one's always true. Um, but if you have an acid as a reactant and then it's not an acid anymore, it's probably uh, an acid base reaction. It, that acid probably gave up an H plus. But you don't have to start from an acid. For instance, if we started from hydrogen carbonate instead. Hydrogen carbonate reacting with ammonia. Instead of making nitrate, we'd make just carbonate. We wouldn't name that as an acid. But we can still look at it and say, well, hydrogen carbonate turned into carbonate. It lost a hydrogen ion, right? That's your dead giveaway that is acid-base reaction. And if you can learn to recognize that, when in, in polyatomic ions are actually your friend in this case. Because if you've got the same polyatomic ion on both sides, its oxidation state didn't change. If you went from nitrate to nitrite, that's a redox reaction. If you went from phosphate to phosphite or from phosphate to phosphorus, that's a redox reaction. But if, if it's carbonate on both sides, it's not a redox reaction, or at least the carbonate's not part of the redox reaction. All right, last but not least, our precipitation reactions. And precipitation reactions are called precipitation reactions because you start by mixing together two solutions. And if you happen to make a compound that's not soluble in water, you make a combination of ions that doesn't dissolve in water, it turns into a solid. So precipitation in meteorology means that you had water dissolved in the atmosphere and it turned into liquid water and fell to, fell to the ground, right? Precipitation reactions in chemistry means you started with two things with a bunch of ions dissolved in water, 
And when you mix them together, some of them stuck together and fell, fall to the bottom as a solid. So they're, they share the same root word. They don't mean the same thing exactly. Um, but this is 100%, this is your definition of a precipitation reaction. If you mix two aqueous solutions and you make a solid, that's a precipitation reaction. Right, so for these ones, you usually want to be paying attention. Well, not usually. For these ones, you need to be paying attention to the phases. But it's usually going to look like two ionic compounds that are aqueous form two ionic compounds, one of which is a solid. So for instance, sodium chloride, aqueous, plus silver nitrate, aqueous reacts to form silver chloride solid plus sodium nitrate aqueous. Mixing together two ionic solutions to make a solid, that's a precipitation reaction. And just like we were talking about, this, when we're dealing with ionic compounds and polyatomic ions, it's really easy to spot a redox reaction or a lack of a redox reaction. You had nitrates here, you've still got nitrate. You had chloride here, you've still got chloride. You've got silver ions here, you still have silver ions. You have sodium ions here, you still have sodium ions. We just happen to mix them in a way that water is not able to keep these two from sticking together. So it turns into a solid. Um, did, you do so, did you look at solubility rules before in your, in your other chemistry class? That uh, chlorides are usually soluble except for silver ions, mercury one ions, and lead two ions. That all sound familiar. So hopefully precipitation reactions should seem like review, which should also make them easy to recognize, right? Because that's the big skill from today is being able to look at a reaction. I'm not going to ask you to complete a reaction yet. At this stage, if I give you reactants and products, can you tell me what type of reaction that is? All right. And it's going to be in this, these same categories. It's either a redox or it's not. If it's not a redox, it's going to, it'll be a precipitation acid base or something else but you should still be able to use the oxidation states to say, well, I don't know what the heck that is, but it's definitely not a redox reaction, right? And same over here. I don't know what the, what the heck's going on with nitrate turning into nitrite, but I know it's gotta be a redox reaction. And then if you can put it in one of these more specific categories, most of them will be able to fit into one of these other categories as well. We make sure there was nothing else. More practice with oxidation states. All right, so last, last thing with my last five minutes. If we can look at a redox reaction, in general, redox reactions are more interesting. Most of the, the more interesting chemical reactions that happen, more useful chemical reactions that happen, tend to be redox reactions. Um, and they tend to be a little bit more complicated, which is part of what makes them more interesting uh, because moving electrons around to different stability levels is, is uh, creates some really different situations from what you started with. Complexation reactions, nothing's really happening. You could argue acid base or acids are interesting because they cause burns, but they don't like chemically, the reaction's not all that interesting. Biologically, what happens is more interesting. Um, so we're, we kind of need a separate set of vocabulary to talk about redox reactions a little bit. So for this reaction, this is what happens when you put sodium metal in water. Has anybody seen that done before? You guys didn't do that in, in your first chemistry class? Oh, that's what got me hooked on chemistry. Throw a piece of sodium metal in water. Do you know what happens? 
it, it explodes, it catches fire because it's really, really and it produces hydrogen gas. And hydrogen gas is flammable. Is this a redox reaction? As soon as you can spot one thing changing charge, you can say it's a redox reaction. Can you spot one thing changing charge? Hydrogen, what is it starting and ending as in terms of oxidation state? The plus one here, over here it's a zero. Is the oxygen changing in any of these? Uh, it's still minus two in all these. What's the other side here? This is zero. And how about over here? What's the charge on sodium? Plus one. So what's oxidized and what's reduced? Sodium going from a zero to a plus one, did it gain or lose electrons? Gained electrons, lost electrons? Good, so if it lost electrons, that makes it oxidation, Leo. And if the hydrogen went from a plus one, to a zero, that's our reduction. So the last piece of vocab here, whatever starts, whatever is oxidized, if you change the way you wrote that, the way you structured that sentence, say we could say sodium is oxidized. We could also say sodium reduces whatever you put it with. So sodium is oxidized, and then it, that acts to reduce the things around it. It kind of makes sense a little bit, kind of like endothermic, exothermic. But the English language is confusing because if it, if it goes through an oxidation process, that means that sodium is the reducing agent. Agent means it acts on something else. So reducing agent reduces whatever you put it with. And an oxidizing, is the compound that causes something else to be oxidized. And so it's a weird little, you flip your frame of reference a little bit by using that word agent, which is really confusing and obnoxious, I know. Um, however, it will serve you well to understand that because we, a lot of times, especially in OCHEM, we're always looking at our OCHEM from the point of view of whatever the carbon-based molecule is. And so sometimes we'll put an organic molecule through a reaction and it gets oxidized because we used an oxidizing agent on our, on our carbon-based compound. So if we're always from the point of view of, say, the, the water in this case, say, well, the the water is reduced because we used a reducing agent on it, right? So it's just a weird little idiosyncrasy to get used to and that terminology will keep coming back um, if you continue on in chemistry and in sciences. Reduce the idea of a reducing agent is really, really common. You see it actually a lot in biology. You see in a reducing environment, if you put things in the right pH or with the right chemicals in the water, it's a reducing environment. And some cells do well in a reducing environment and some don't. On um, oxidizing environments are the opposite. Our planet is an oxidizing environment because there's lots of oxygen in it. All right, have a good weekend, everybody. Take the quiz and I'll have your tests for you, hopefully Monday. I should be able to make Monday. <laughs>